structured. So thank you, Julio. Uh, we have, uh, this panel is about the generative logic of the commons, and we wanted to explore the commons as a value proposition in its own right, uh, distinct from other ways of creating value, most notably, or creating wealth, most notably uh, the market. And we have two different perspectives on that. Uh, Roberto Verzola uh, will be talking, he is a uh, founder of the Philippine Greens and has been an activist on a variety of environmental issues over the years, uh, from nuclear power to genetic engineering to uh, various agriculture and farming uh, methods issues, uh, as well as intellectual property rights. He participates in the Copy South Research Group and uh, has more recently focused on the political economy of abundance. So we will hear from him first, followed by Stefan Meretz. Good morning. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, uh, do you all have copies of my prepared talk? Uh, there are still a few copies there at the translator's uh, table, if, if you don't have, because um, I, I won't read the speech, but uh, I will instead help you go over the 10 assur uh, assertions uh, in the paper to get a better sense out of it. Uh, so I hope uh, while I'm making my presentation, you are either reading the paper or uh, you can read it afterwards. Okay? So, uh, the first assertion uh, that I make in the paper is that there's abundance of free or low-cost information and knowledge on the internet. This is obvious and uncontroversial, so I, I, I'll skip that. Uh, the first assertion leads immediately to the second that uh, this information abundance is forcing a deeper look at the concept of abundance itself. Assertion two, says that uh, abundance is a neglected concept because mainstream economics assumes it away by defining itself as a study of scarce resources. Thus, unlike the rich literature from the long history of commons research, we have few theories of abundance. The rest of my talk is about a theory of abundance. Uh, assertions three and five in the paper identify sources or wellsprings of abundance. Elsewhere, I have also used the term mechanis the mechanistic term engines of abundance. These assertions lead to a typology of abundance. And for more details, there's a book on display outside, uh, Access to Knowledge in the Age of Intellectual Property, which contains a longer piece undermining abundance. There's also a, a Wolfgang Hoscheles book on the economics of abundance. Uh, let's start with the wellspring of information abundance. Think of a bottle. You can bottle water, food, air, and most other goods for sale. If you use up the bottle's contents, it's gone. That's scarcity. But drinking from a bottle of ideas will never use up the contents of the bottle. That's abundance. Think of a curious child. It will touch, smell, taste, look at, and listen to almost anything. And once it learns to talk, anything and everything bottled up in its mind will come out. It is an innate urge to absorb information and to communicate information. The internet, in effect, uh, uh, well, this uh, innate urge to absorb and communicate, it's a universal human urge. So the, the internet, in effect, offers a huge set of bottled ideas for the child in all of us. And each bottle keeps on giving and giving and giving, and that is why we have information abundance. Think of DNA. They are also like bottled ideas. Mother Nature bottled these ideas into genes, cells, organisms, and species, and put an intrinsic reproductive urge in every living organism to spread one's DNA to reproduce one's own kind. And that is why nature, and if we do it right, agriculture too, also keeps on giving and giving and giving through balanced and highly productive ecosystems that provide us with perpetual streams of natural income. New soil, clean air and water, foods, 
uh, stuff for clothes and houses, medicine, fuel, industrial inputs, and a thousand other goods and services, as well as psychic rewards too. Where life does not bloom abundantly anymore, something must have upset the natural abundance. Even these damaged ecosystems, if left alone, soon teem with life again. The generative logic we see in many commons comes, I suggest, from this inner logic of sharing in humans and reproduction in living organisms. The massive bulk of water and minerals on Earth and energy from the sun are also wellsprings of abundance. The Earth's mineral abundance is non-renewable and must therefore be managed differently from renewable solar energy. As oil production peaks, for instance, cheap abundant liquid fuel will soon come to an end. Peak oil should teach us an unforgettable lesson in managing bottles of goods that are used up. Those who miss the lesson will go for more coal, nuclear power, and agrofuels. Those who get it will shift to clean renewables, energy efficiency, and plant descent, which is what transition towns are now doing. One more wellspring of abundance I'd like to mention, the webs of positive human relationships, acquaintances, friendships, family, community, which generate feelings of peace, contentment, love, happiness, and other psychic rewards which defy quantification. Each of these wellsprings of abundance creates an archetype, a distinct category of abundance, information, biological, bulk, psychic, and so on. Once we open our eyes to the potential abundance around us, the wellsprings, archetypes, etc., we can appreciate assertion number eight, that the possibility exists of making one abundance lead to another, of creating cascades of abundance. People with access to land of often stay poor simply because they have forgotten how to tap and build on the abundance that nature lays at their feet or the wealth of know-how humanity has accumulated over time. All of us must learn again to re recognize abundance when it happens, to tap existing abundance, and to make it last indefinitely. We must learn to bring about the conditions that generate each archetype so that we can create cascades of new abundance. So in my paper, some examples, uh, I cite some examples from agriculture and the internet. Uh, creating cascades of abundance is hardest in the industrial sector because its substantial material and energy needs tend to disrupt ecological systems. If industrial processes could be turned into closed material loops, fueled by renewables, just like ecological processes, this may yet provide the key to cascading industrial abundance. Photovoltaics are made from semiconducting silicon, the elemental basis of the digital revolution. $6,000 LCD projectors 10 years ago now cost less than 1000 If photovoltaics followed similar plunging price trends as other digital goods, then we can create more cascades of new solar-based abundance and bring in a solar age. As we get better at building balanced ecologies of agricultural, industrial, and information abundance, our communities will enjoy even more continuing streams of goods, services, psychic rewards, and other benefits. So, uh, if we have learned to recognize abundance, their generative logic, their archetypes, etc., if we have become better in creating new abundance and cascades of them, what next? That's assertion number six. Abundance creates commons. Uh, question, before refrigerators, what did people do when they had too much food? Answer, they threw a party. So abundance creates commons. I will leave it to the commons experts here to tell us more about the commons. Uh, but uh, we have now covered the papers, assertions one to five, the archetypes of abundance, assertion eight on cascading abundance, and assertion six on abundance creating commons. We are left with the more debatable seven, nine, and 10. Suppose we are now wallowing in abundance as we are of information on the internet. We have the proverbial goose that uh, many of them, in fact, that lays golden eggs. What next? Assertion seven raises one more neglected concept, like the concepts of abundance and commons, whose time has come, I think. This is the concept of reliability. It is an engineer's term, but you might be more familiar with the related social concepts of sustainability, equity, risk aversion, and the precautionary principle. 
The goal of reliability is to minimize the risk of failure. It tries to make abundance last indefinitely without failing. Assertion 7 says that under conditions of abundance, reliability, that is reducing the risk that abundance will fail, becomes more important than efficiency. Efficiency, which is uh, maximizing gain and minimizing waste, is very important when resources are scarce. This has been the focus of mainstream economics. But when resources, resources are abundant, efficiency recedes in importance. When nature releases millions of sperm, although only one will fertilize an egg, it is after minimizing the risk of failure, not minimizing waste. It's after reliability, not efficiency. We'd rather ensure that the goose stays fit and alive than force it to lay two eggs instead of one every day. We are now left with uh, the two remaining assertions, nine and 10. Uh, I earlier said that abundance creates commons. Unfortunately, pooling resources in common is not the only mindset that abundance spawns. Assertion nine says that abundance spawns two contrary mindsets. Holding its source in common is great for the whole community and for future generations, but monopolizing it is great for private profit making. So two, two contrary mindsets, commons or monopoly. An example in agriculture is the contest between one, farmers who share commonly held seed varieties among themselves versus two, multinationals who extract monopoly rents from their proprietary seeds through plant variety protection, patents, F1 hybrids, and terminator technology. In the industries of the West, very little is commonly held now, and monopolistic mindset holds sway. A curious exception, however, is the world's main source of industrial abundance today, China, which boasts of one, a huge but less dominant state sector in precarious balance with two, a growing corporate soft sector under the Communist Party's schizophrenic ideology of market uh, socialism. In the information economy, one, user movements of copyright and patent exemptions, open access, free software, and other forms of non-exclusivity have made, made big inroads. However, two, corporations and governments are trying to stem the tide of sharing by tightening IPR enforcement through agreements like the GATT WTO and the up and coming ACTA. So two mindsets, one commons and two monopoly. There's a third mindset actually. Uh, if abundance, uh, abundance spawns two mindsets, scarcity spawns three. Commons, monopoly, and the third one is competition. I think the dynamics between these three will define the economics of the 21st century. The main carriers of the monopoly mindset are corporations. I talked earlier about urges, the human urge to communicate and the biological urge to reproduce. Our legal system also put an urge into corporations. It's a single urge to seek profits. This one-track mind has made corporations take over commons of abundance from seeds to land to knowledge and turn this into monopolies because it is profitable to do so. What they could not take over, they have undermined or sabotaged to create artificial scarcity. Corporations have destroyed the fertility of our soils, substituting commercial synthetics in their place. They have stopped the natural flow of mother's milk in, fa in favor of commercial formula. They have bought out independent seed companies to, uh, to force feed us with genetically modified toxic foods, all in pursuit of profit. They have become, in Wolfgang's Hoschelis words, scarcity generating institutions. Unfortunately, the corporations came in before Isaac Asimov's three laws of robotics. In the 1950s, when robots were mostly figments of imagination of science fiction writers, Asimov wrote the novel I, Robot, where he laid down the three laws to ensure that intelligent man-made automata did not take over the world and enslave mankind, humankind. The first law was a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. The second law, a robot must obey orders given it by human beings except where such orders would not conflict with the first law. And the third law was, was about uh, self-preservation, as long as it did not conflict with the first and second laws. We would be much better off today if all corporations, which like robots are man-made automata, were constrained by these laws. 
uh, but when we granted legal personhood to corporations, turning them into de facto man-made species of business automata, we built into them not the three laws for automata, but the single urge to seek profits. Corporations have since confirmed the science fictionists' worst fears about runaway automata. They have become super aggressive players in our political, economic, and social worlds. Beating us in our own game, they have taken over governments, economies, and media. They have become masters in domesticating homo sapiens. They, have now, they now house, feed, train, and employ tamed humans to serve as their workhorses, pack mules, milking cows, watchdogs, stool pigeons, and smart asses. Assertion 10 argues that corporations are now the dominant species on this planet. They routinely ignore human orders, injure human beings, and foul up ecosystems in violation of laws for automata. These man-made mammoths now occupy the top of the food chain and have become the greatest threat to human well-being and the survival of many species on this planet. With our conscious mind, unique intelligence, and creative powers, Homo sapiens says a new story of creation is the universe's own way of looking at itself, of appreciating its own beauty, origins, evolution, and the grandeur of it all. This gives us a huge burden of responsibility, not only to the living world, but uh, to the whole universe itself. We face, I believe, three fundamental and interrelated challenges in the 21st century. First, we must reacquire a species consciousness as homo sapiens to reestablish our deep connections with the natural world. Second, we must free ourselves from corporate control. To do so, we must learn not to depend on corporations to keep ourselves alive and healthy, and not to depend on corporations to educate our young. We must instead rely on each other and on sources of abundance we ourselves can build, maintain, and hold in common. Third, we must reestablish control over corporations. This involves reprogramming them to obey Asimov's three laws for automata or the equivalent. It also involves, as we did against big prehistoric predators, hunting down disobedient corporations and disbanding or bankrupting or otherwise eliminating them. Taking out the disobedient from the corporate gene pool is the first step in reclaiming our role as stewards of the natural world and as masters of our own creations. Thank you.